عليه وآله لا يمر يوم في حياة الرسول إلا ويأتي إلى بيت فاطمة فيطرق الباب ويدخل ويسأل عن ولديه الحسن والحسين يلاعبهما يقضي شيئا من الوقت معهما هذا دأبه في كل يوم تقريبا في كل يوم وإذا ذهب إلى المسجد ذهب أحدهما معه هكذا كان النبي صلى الله عليه وآله يظهر علاقته الحميمة مع حفيديه وخصوصا الإمام الحسن صلوات الله وسلامه عليه عاش الإمام الحسن فترة مع جده المصطفى صلى الله عليه وآله ولما توفي النبي صلى الله عليه وآله كان الحسن في السابعة أو الثامنة من عمره وفجع بعد فترة قصيرة بوفاة أمه ونشأ تحت ظل والده أمير المؤمنين عليه السلام فكان الساعد الأيمن لأبيه وكان الوزير والمستشار والمؤتمن عند والده الإمام الحسن عليه السلام هناك روايات تتحدث أن الإمام الحسن والحسين عليهما السلام شاركا في بعض الحروب في غزو أفريقيا تحت قيادة عبد الله بن سعد بن أبي سرح وروايات تقول أن الإمام شارك في فتح طبرستان وجرجان لم تثبت هذه الروايات هذه الروايات لم تنقل إلينا من خلال مصادر موثوقة لم نتأكد من صحة مثل هذه الروايات وخصوصا أننا نعتقد أن كثيرا من هذه عمليات الغزو التي سميت بالفتوح لم تكن مرضية من قبل أهل البيت عليهم السلام لم يثبت أن أئمتنا عليهم السلام وافقوا على مثل هذه الفتوح أو الغزوات التي كان الغرض منها ليس نشر الإسلام بمقدار ما كان الغرض منها التوسع والهيمنة وجلب الأموال وجلب العبيد والإماء وصرف الناس عن كثير مما كان يشغلهم من أمور الساعة لم يثبت أن أئمتنا عليهم السلام كانوا يدعمون مثل هذه الفتوح أو الغزوات على كل حال لما تولى الإمام أمير المؤمنين الخلافة كان الإمام الحسن ساعده الأيمن ووزيره ومستشاره وهو الذي أنهى معركة الجمل معركة الجمل سمعتم بها استمرت فترة طويلة كان الإمام يحاول أن ينهيها بأقل قدر من الخسائر لكن وجود الجمل كان يتسبب في إطالة أمد الحرب حتى تمكن الإمام الحسن عليه السلام من الوصول إلى الجمل وقتله فانتهت المعركة بعد ذلك باستسلام أهل الجمل وكان مع أبيه أمير المؤمنين في معركة صفين وكان مع الإمام في كل هذه الأحوال والأوضاع يشارك أباه أمير المؤمنين عليه السلام في القرارات المصيرية التي كان يتخذها وكان الإمام أمير المؤمنين عليه السلام يحيل إليه الناس في بعض القضايا قضايا الفتوى والقضاء كان يحيلها إلى الإمام الحسن عليه السلام ليظهر لهم علم الإمام ومعرفة الإمام وعبقرية الإمام عليه السلام ولما استشهد أمير المؤمنين عليه السلام تولى الإمام الحسن عليه السلام الخلافة بأمر 
من أبيه أمير المؤمنين طبعا أبوه أمير المؤمنين تصرف وفق الوصية التي استلمها من رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم فكان هو الخليفة لمدة ستة أشهر ولكنه بعد ذلك صالح معاوية وهذا الأمر الذي سأتحدث عن في الخطبة الثانية بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله خالق الخلق باسط الرزق فالق الأسباح ذي الجلال والإكرام والفضل والإنعام الحمد لله الذي بعد فلا يرى وقرب فشهد النجوى تبارك وتعالى الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد عبدك ونبيك وحبيبك وصفيك وقيرتك من خلقك وحافظ سرك ومبلغ رسالاتك أفضل وأطيب وأطهر ما صليت على أحد من العالمين وصل على أخيه ووصيه من بعده علي أمير المؤمنين وصل على الصديقة الطاهرة فاطمة سيدة نساء العالمين وصل على سبطي الرحمة وإمامي الهدى الحسن والحسين وصل اللهم على أئمة المسلمين علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والخلف القائم الحجة المهدي أرواحنا فداء وعجل الله تعالى فرجه وسهل مخرجه وجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه والذابين بين يديه بإذن الله My dear brothers, my dear sisters, I was speaking in my first sermon about the role of Imam Al-Hasan alayhi salam. The second Imam of Ahlul Bayt, the older brother of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Unfortunately, there isn't much focus on the life of Al-Imam Al Hassan alayhi salam. Many of us, including those who consider them, themselves followers of Imam Al Hassan, we don't know much about his life. And if we do, sometimes we do that <coughs> in an informed way. Al Imam Al Hassan alayhi salam became the Khalifa after his father. When Imam Ali alayhi salam was martyred, in Kufa, in year 40 Hijri, Imam Hassan السلام, became the next Khalifa. People pledged to him as the next Khalifa. And in fact, that was the will of his father, Amir al Mu'minin and his grandfather, Rasulullah. We in the school of Ahl al Bayt, we believe our Imams have been appointed by Allah. Through the Prophet ﷺ. And that was something handed down by the Prophet to his successors one by one. So Al Imam Al Hassan became the next Khalifa. But six months later, he reached a ceasefire, a truce with Muawiyah. There has been so much talk for last. Over 1,000 years, over this truce. And why is it that Imam Hassan alayhi salam made peace with Muawiyah? And to the point that some people believe that in contrast with Imam Hussein, who chose revolution, uprising, and the sword, Imam Hussein, Imam Hassan chose branch of olive and he chose peace 
and uh, there is some contradiction between the two. There is no contradiction whatsoever between the two. If Imam Hussein was at Imam Hassan's place, he would have done the same. And if Imam Hassan was at the place of Imam Hussein, he would have done the same. It is the conditions in which Imam Hassan alayhi salam lived that differ from the conditions Imam Hussein lived. First of all, my dear brothers and sisters, we have to understand in order for you to fight, you have to have enough supporters. You have to have enough soldiers. And those soldiers have to have conviction, resilience, and the will to fight. That was not the case with Imam al-Hassan, unfortunately. Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam inherited an army of a couple of thousands, but lacked the will to fight. And even those who were willing to fight, they were not so sincere. They were not fighting for the right reason. Remember, in the battle of Safin, Imam Amir al muminin was fighting with Muawiyah. Muawiyah played a trick. He threw a bait. And many of Imam Amir al muminins army soldiers took the bait. Muawiyah, a conniving, a manipulative person, when he realized he's losing the battle, he played a trick on the army of Imam Amir al muminin he said, let's go to the Qur'an. He raised the Qur'an. And he says, let's see what the Qur'an says. What does the Qur'an say? The Qur'an says, if two parties of Muslims fight, then fight the aggressors. Fight the aggressors. Try to bring peace between them, but if one of them resisted peace, fight the group that resists peace, the aggressors. And this is exactly who Muawiyah was. Muawiyah was a rebel. Muawiyah was a rogue member of the community who wanted to challenge the legitimate Imam and the legitimate Khalifa. But unfortunately, many soldiers in the in the army of Amir al muminin they took the bait. To the point they forced Imam Ali alayhi salam to stop the fighting. Malik ibn Malik al-Ashtar, the high-ranking officer and soldier at the army of Imam Ali, he almost won the battle. He was within a few feet from Muawiyah's had a quarter. He was about to capture Muawiyah and bring him as a captive when the pressure was amounting on him to stop the war. Amir al muminin sent him a letter that stopped the war. I am surrounded by those extremists from his own army who are willing to kill him, Imam Ali, if he wouldn't stop the war. Malik said, Ya Amir al muminin just give me a few more minutes and I will finish off this war and I will bring you Muawiyah as a captive. Amir al muminin said to him, do you want to bring Muawiyah to your imam while your imam is alive or dead? To that point, at those rogue element were willing to kill Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib if he would not comply with their demand of stopping the war. Malik had to stop, unfortunately, the war. This is the type of people who are fighting with Amir al muminin alayhi salam. And those are the type of people Imam Hassan inherited in his army. 
people, rebellious, and willing to fight often. And if they fight, they fight on their own terms. Al-Imam Al-Hassan alayhi salam realized there is no <coughs> hope for victory with those people. He can't. He can't fight with these people. No way. And in fact, there is a possibility that they may arrest the Imam himself and take him as prisoner, war prisoner to Muawiyah. The Imam thought the best thing to do right now is to stop the fighting and to reach a truce with Muawiyah. So this gives the time to the good believers good soldiers to basically be draw their lines and prepare themselves for the next battle when was the next battle 10 years after with imam hussein alayhi salam imam hassan was grooming those people soldiers for his brother imam hussein alayhi salam imam hassan was the first one who laid the foundation for the revolution of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And that's how Imam Hussein alayhi salam cultivated the fruit planted by his brother, Imam Hassan alayhi salam. He had enough soldiers to rely on so he can revolt. And that's what happened. Imam Hussein revolted because he found enough supporters to revolt. And that is due to Imam Hassan alayhi salam. The second thing I wanted to touch upon really quick, my dear brothers and sisters, is Imam Hassan alayhi salam became a subject of a very vicious, vicious propaganda campaign by Muawiyah and his supporters, trying to tarnish his reputation. Remember, the truce treaty Imam Hassan alayhi salam signed with Muawiyah with mandate to have Imam Hassan as the next ruler, Khalifa, after Muawiyah. If Muawiyah dies, Imam Hassan will take over. Muawiyah was trying his best to tarnish the reputation of Imam Hassan so he cannot be the next Khalifa. So this way, what he would do, he would spread rumors that Imam Hassan Billah, is a womanizer. All he does, he gets married, he divorces his wives. This is the rumors that Muawiyah and his apparatus were spreading about Imam Al Hassan alayhi salam. When that did not work and people didn't buy those rumors, he resorted to another vicious way of eliminating Al-Imam Al-Hassan, and that was by poisoning Al-Imam Al-Hassan. Muawiyah wrote a letter <clears throat> to the Roman Empire of the time, asking him for a lethal poison that would not leave any chance for the victim to survive. The Roman king replied, by saying this type of poison is prohibited. Selling this type of poison is prohibited under my rule. I can't sell you this type of poison. Muawiyah sent him another letter sa saying to him, you didn't ask me who do I want this poison for. And the Roman Empire asked who? Who you want it for? He says, I wanted, I wanted to kill with this poison the man whose grandfather came to extinguish your religion and Christianity. Referring to Imam al Hassan alayhi salam and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa I want this poison to kill a man, <coughs> with it to kill a man whose grandfather came to extinguish Christianity. Then the Roman Empire sold him the poison. 
he sent 100,000 dirham to Ju'adah, the wife of Imam al-Hassan. And he promised her if she kills Imam Hassan, he will make her marry her son Yazid. Now, unfortunately, Jada belonged to a family of conspirators. Her father, her father Al Ash'ath bin Qais, was a man who would always, always put hurdles in the ways of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he participated in the murder of Imam Ali. Her brother, Muhammad, participated in the killing of Imam Hussein 10 years later. And she participated in the killing of Imam Hassan. You see a father, a daughter, and a son, three individuals from the same family whose hands have been stained with the blood of three Imams. Imam Ali, the father, Imam Hassan, the daughter, Ja'da, Imam Hussein, with Muhammad ibn Ash'ath. He was one of the soldiers who participated a bit with Ibn Ziyad in fighting Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Unfortunately, Al Imam al Hussein realized that there is a plot to kill his brother. He visited his Imam, his brother Imam Hassan, during his last minute before dying. He found him throwing up all the blood and he realized that's a sign of poison. Imam Hussein insisted on the identity of the person who inserted the poison for his brother. Imam Hassan begged Imam Hussein not to take further action. And he asked when he dies, he wants to be buried next to his grandfather, Rasulullah. And if they don't allow that, he would be buried in the Baqiya. When Imam Hassan was brought by the, his family, by the Hashimin, Bani Hashim, to be buried next to his grandfather, Rasulullah, some people refused. They rejected. They did not allow Imam Hassan to be buried next to his grandfather. Bani Umayya, they took their gun and they came out and they said, we will not allow Hassan to be buried next to his grandfather when Uthman is buried in a Jewish cemetery. As to retaliate for the death of Uthman, even though the death of Uthman had nothing to do with Imam Hassan alayhi salam. And then ultimately Al Imam al Hussein alayhi salam decided to bury him in Al Baqiya. Salamullahi alayhi. My dear brothers and sisters, I have few minutes only. I want to preserve those few four minutes <coughs> for few comments on contemporary issues, mainly on what I heard today in the news that Denmark, the government of Denmark, is considering a ban on burning religious books, the Torah, the Bible, and the Quran. Well, that's good news. That's good news that Denmark is a leading European country, government, is considering a ban on burning the divine books. Obviously, the focus is on the Quran because nobody would, in Europe would burn the Torah or the Bible. It is the Quran that has become a subject of burning lately in Europe, in Denmark, and in Sweden. That's a good thing, my dear brothers and sisters. That's a good thing to see finally Denmark and hopefully other European countries will follow through by putting such ban. <clears throat> now, some people, some organizations in Denmark are saying they are objecting to this ban by saying we cannot impose any restrictions 
in Europe on free speech. You do. You do. Europe don't lie. You do. You don't allow any person to deny the Holocaust. And for the Holocaust deniers, they have one way out. It's jail. If you deny the Holocaust in Europe, you will end up in jail. But for burning Quran, you can do it because it's freedom of expression. My dear brothers and sisters, this is how pressure works. There are some governments do not know no other language but the language of pressure. You have to pressure. And I encourage Muslims to keep the pressure. Just like the Jews. The Jews keep the pressure. Nobody can deny the Holocaust. And I'm obviously, I'm not someone who would advocate for denying the Holocaust. But I commend the Jews for putting the pressure on the <clears throat> international community so no one can dare to deny the Holocaust. I think we Muslims need to do the same. We need to keep the pressure on Europe, on Sweden and Denmark. I don't mean through violence, not at all, but through civil means, such as Muslim countries withdrawing their ambassadors to those two countries, such as Muslims boycotting any commodities made in Sweden and Denmark, and through other civil means, civilian means. We need to keep the pressure. Otherwise, otherwise, they will continue insulting our religion. They will continue insulting the Quran. Once in a while, someone would decide to make fun of our Holy Prophet ﷺ by drawing a cartoon on the Prophet. That's the only way to keep the pressure. When Muslims learn to keep the pressure, they will yield. But when we Muslims become careless, apathetic, we don't care. We are being slapped on our right. We tell them thank you. We are being slapped on our left cheek. We tell them thank you. Why they should care? Why they should care? But when Muslims speak all in one voice, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Iraq, many other countries, I commend those Islamic countries for reacting, for speaking up, for doing at least the minimal by withdrawing the ambassador of those countries, then those countries will respect us. Then they will pass laws respecting our holy Quran. We Muslims need to send a powerful message to the world, particularly to Europe. That our Quran is not a toy in the hand of your kids. You got to respect us. And you got to respect our faith. And you got to respect our religion. And our religion is not something that you can use in your internal fighting or internal games. Our Quran is not a subject for freedom of speech. You can do other things, but not our Quran. Our Quran and all other divine books, including the Bible, including the Torah. We reject any attempt to insult those religions and insult those books because we believe the original Torah, the original Bible are words of God revealed to Moses and Jesus. And no human has the right under any pretext to insult any prophet of God or to desecrate any divine book. Allahumma kfir lil mu'mineen wal mu'minat wal muslimina wal muslimat.